Facing the onslaught of zombies, the three of them took refuge in a revolving glass door. The situation was extremely perilous, with zombies waiting both inside and outside. Nicholas was panicking inside the door, and Glenn had run out of bullets. It was only a matter of time before the glass shattered. He calmed down and started thinking about what to do. It seemed like a dead end. At that moment, they heard a car horn outside. Glenn looked outside and saw Eugene driving towards them for support. The car's speakers were playing music, and Eugene was shouting loudly. The zombies outside were quickly drawn away, greatly relieving the pressure on the three of them. However, now they faced another problem. In order to open the door and go outside, someone on the other side would be left inside. Glenn couldn't bring himself to sacrifice his teammate. He called out to Nicholas, comforting him and urging him to stay calm. After the two of them had secured the door with force, Glenn began using the butt of his gun to strike the glass. The first hit was too weak, but on the second attempt, Nicholas' side of the door swung open a crack. That idiot hadn't secured the revolving door properly. Being inexperienced, he became even more anxious and had to forcefully close the door again. Glenn reassured him, telling him to apply more force while securing the door. It was their only option now. When Glenn counted to three, Nicholas forcefully pushed the door, creating a gap. He was determined to run outside. However, this meant that he would be leading the zombies towards Glenn and the others, essentially sacrificing them. Glenn was also in a panic, shouting at Nicholas not to do it. The idiot tries harder to get out. Meanwhile, Noah had already been grabbed by the zombies, with their hands reaching inside. In the end, Nicholas managed to escape. But Noah was dragged away by the zombies right in front of Glenn's eyes. He let out a helpless scream of pain as he watched Noah being torn apart by the zombies. Glenn felt a deep sense of guilt for not taking care of this kind-hearted boy. On the other hand, Eugene had managed to shake off the zombies and was slowly walking towards them. Nicholas approached him, saying, We have to go. He opened the door to the driver's seat, while Eugene, uncharacteristically assertive, took away the car keys, asking where their people were. Nicholas threatened him directly, saying, Either come with me or die here, it's your choice. Just as Eugene was about to pull out his gun, Nicholas pushed him to the ground and swiftly started the car, ready to leave. To his surprise, Glenn chased after them and pulled Nicholas down, delivering two powerful punches. Eugene, looking at the sorrowful Glenn, realized what had happened. On their way back, Glenn was in no mood to talk. It's been a really bad day. Tara was injured, and Noah was also bitten to death by a zombie because of that bastard. During their absence, other things had happened within the community as well. Abraham had been assigned to their team, and they had gone out to a construction site to gather materials for expanding the walls. The community needed those supplies for its expansion. However, Abraham was not quite accustomed to this kind of life. In comparison, he preferred wielding a gun outside, killing zombies. At that moment, a group of zombies emerged from the woods. Everyone grabbed their guns and started shooting. Since the apocalypse began, they have always lived within the confines of the wall, and their marksmanship was largely improvised. Abraham quickly joined the fray. This was his battlefield. Tobin, the leader, kills the zombies under the excavator, but he didn't expect to blow the pressure arm of the excavator. The woman on guard above fell off. The zombies were only three or four meters away from her. Tobin was terrified and ordered everyone to retreat behind the truck, believing that the woman was beyond saving. However, Abraham took action. He stepped forward and shot down the two closest zombies before pulling the woman to safety. Just as they were about to retreat, more zombies approached from another direction, with no other choice. Abraham had the woman hide inside the truck while he remained in place. When everyone thought he would die, Abraham managed to escape from under the vehicle and shot the zombies crawling beneath it. Calmly, he handed his gun to the woman, instructing her to provide cover fire from the outside. Meanwhile, he picked up a meteor hammer. Killing zombies in close quarters was his specialty, and it was only a matter of time before they were eliminated. The only setback was that the woman's shooting skills were wasting ammunition. A man who had been observing from the back was in awe. They couldn't believe that Abraham had survived. Tobin urged the man to retreat, but he was so stunned by Abraham's actions that he decided not to back down. He grabbed his gun and charged forward. At the end Abraham gives Tobin a straightforward lecture, abandoning her teammates leaving her in place to die. Tobin tried to argue. The woman comes up and punches him in the face. The men came up to make peace, tell them to stop fighting, come back to work tomorrow. But Abraham thinks the zombie encounter was just a hiccup. Why not work? He then went straight to work assigning tasks. He took even better precautions. Any one of Rick's team is a great leader out there. Tobin is a good guy. 
he just didn't have the experience of surviving a post-apocalyptic world. The first thing he did when he got back was find Deanna. He resigned as captain. He thought Abraham was more than capable, and he doesn't hesitate to praise him. He also blames himself for almost getting a woman killed. Maggie is pleased that the people in her team are fully capable of doing the job. Deanna agreed to Tobin's resignation, although she had some concerns about granting too much power to Rick and his group. Meanwhile, Carol found herself still being sought out by Sam, the young boy she had threatened. Carol, despite her fondness for children, was reluctant to form emotional attachments too easily in the current circumstances. She had maintained a cold and distant demeanor, even instructing Sam not to speak to her. However, Sam was a chatterbox who seemed to enjoy being around her. Sam continued to enjoy visiting her and had even managed to sneak some chocolate for making cookies. Carol's compassionate side started to stir, and she gradually softened her demeanor and took an active interest in him. Sam told her why he was here. He actually wanted to ask Carol for a gun. Carol inquired about the reason, wanting to know why Sam wanted the handgun. Sam simply replied that it wasn't for himself. Clearly there is something that cannot be said. Carol realized that this was a significant problem and was eager to find out what he intended to do. However, Sam refused to say anything further and ran out the door. Feeling concerned, Carol couldn't shake off her worries and decided to knock on Sam's house door. It was his father who opened the door and the man dodged a little, as if he was afraid Carol would see what was happening inside. Eventually, he abruptly closed the door without any courtesy. Carol had already guessed what had happened. She then sought out Rick and informed him that Sam's mother, Jesse, was likely experiencing domestic violence regularly, which explained why the child wanted a gun to protect her. Carol empathized with the situation, as she had experienced something similar in her past. What's even more surprising is that, Gabriel managed to find Deanna and expressed his desire to talk to her privately, noticing that there was no one else inside the house. He began rambling about God and demons, he mentioned that their community was like a paradise and that he was very grateful to be here. However, he believed that Deanna's mistake was allowing others, particularly Rick and his group, to enter. Gabriel claimed that they were all bad people, and that they had done unimaginable, atrocious things. Deanna responded that, Rick had mentioned these things during the previous conversation and acknowledged that they had to do something in order to survive. However, she didn't believe that Rick was without principles. Gabriel, still persevering, wears a resigned expression as if Rick and his team have done something terrible to him. He continued trying to convince Deanna not to trust them. Gabriel had previously caused the deaths of many of his followers. Rick's group was aware of his actions, therefore, he attempted to find ways to drive them away. Deanna didn't fully trust Gabriel's one-sided account, just said she would think about it and let him go. Maggie, as Deanna's assistant, often stays in her house and overhears Gabriel's words. Deanna, after listening to him and considering the power dynamics, began to question the rightness of accepting Rick's group. But at that moment, there was a shout from outside. Glenn and the others had returned. The death of her son had left Deanna's family in a state of silence. Even her husband Reg was in tears. After Nicholas returned, he recounted the events leading to Aiden's death. He sorrowfully explained that Aiden had been shooting at a zombie while trying to save them. However, Glenn intentionally distracted him, resulting in an explosion. Aiden didn't die, but he was severely injured. Nicholas insisted on saving him, but they all abandoned him and he had no choice. Then, as we entered the hall, we were trapped in the revolving door. To escape, they pushed me towards the zombies. During each interview, Deanna recorded everything and watched the footage closely. Would she believe Nicholas' words based on the recorded evidence? Deanna learned of her son's tragic death, and surprisingly, she didn't pursue the matter further. At that moment, Rick arrived not to console her but to discuss how to handle Jesse's domestic abuse situation. During their conversation, Rick was taken aback when he realized that Deanna had known about it all along. It seemed that domestic abuse had been ongoing. But Pete, Jesse's husband, was a surgeon. Such talents are very important in a post-apocalyptic world. It wasn't worth provoking him, and Tara was treated by him for her injury. Rick couldn't understand why they would tolerate domestic abuse just because Pete was a doctor. He feared that Jesse might end up dead the next time. Rick proposed his own solution to Deanna, urging her to consider it. He believed that separating Jesse and Pete would be the best course of action, and if Pete refused, they should execute him directly. We exile him if it comes to that. Rick was speechless. Deanna had no understanding of the cruelty of the outside world. People who had been exiled would undoubtedly harbor resentment and could potentially bring harm to their community. The two of them got into an argument. Deanna told Rick to stop making these barbaric proposals. Killing cannot exist in their communities. 
It was evident that she already has a big problem with Rick's team. Rick chose not to say anything further, he knew he couldn't leave this place. He would take over if he had to. Afterward, Rick went to Jesse's house. He was straightforward and made it clear that he knew about Pete's abusive behavior. This kind of behavior had to stop. Jesse was taken aback. There were already tears of anguish in her eyes. However, she still defended her husband, claiming that he had changed and that she would persuade him to stop. She can handle this. Rick knew it was practically impossible. He persisted in expressing his desire to help her, which surprised Jesse. She asked him why he cared if she ended up getting killed. Rick was momentarily stunned for a couple of seconds, realizing that he had developed feelings for her. He was about to say what was on his mind. I'm married. And that was the end of their conversation. As Rick walked along the road, his heart pounded. Being seen through just now made him a little nervous. He thought about it again and looked at Sam playing outside. He decided he couldn't leave it alone. Taking a deep breath, he returned to Jesse's house. Jesse clearly didn't want to discuss the matter any further. Rick directly said, Do you know your son went to someone else to get a gun to protect you? Jesse instantly broke down upon hearing Rick's words. The reason she had refused Rick's help was to avoid further angering her husband. She felt a deep sense of powerlessness in her family. Rick went on to say that the situation within the community is no different from the world outside. They had food to eat and houses to live in. But they couldn't just settle for a compromised existence. You can't always endure silently and swallow your pride. He emphasized that if she ended up getting killed, what would happen to her children? Domestic violence wouldn't end without resistance. Jessie finally absorbed what Rick was saying. Her son's actions had deeply touched her. Rick then confessed, saying, I don't want you to die either. I can protect you and your son's safety. You just need to nod and agree to let me help you. Jesse understood his intentions. So she asked would you do the same for someone else? Would you go all out for someone else? She was direct in her questioning. Rick whispered, no. That's when Jesse indicated her agreement and said, I agree to let you help me. Just as she finished speaking, her husband, Pete, emerged from the room and asked Rick, why are you here? If there's nothing important, I'll have to ask you to leave. Rick didn't respond. Instead, Jesse, this time, firmly opposed her husband. Pete was shocked that she dared to defy him, especially in front of others. Just go, Pete. What are you talking about? Jesse went on to say that it was you who should leave. Pete immediately realized that Rick must have said something to her. He started shouting at her. Rick said flatly, let's go out and sort this out. You come into my house, Pete. You and me are leaving. You're leaving right now. You think you're the law? You actually think you have a say in anything here? Step back. Who the hell do you think you are? Someone's trying not to kill you. The two men immediately wrestled with each other. They exchanged a couple of punches and eventually crashed through a window onto the street. The commotion attracted everyone's attention, and as they arrived, they saw both of them covered in blood. Jesse attempted to intervene, but she received a slap in the face. Rick couldn't take it anymore and just exploded, regaining the initiative. He grabbed Pete by the neck. If he hadn't restrained himself, he might have killed him right then and there. Deanna rushed over and pleaded with Rick to stop. Others tried to approach, but Rick pulled out a hidden handgun. With his bloodied face and his actions, he appeared truly unhinged. He angrily turned to Deanna and said, You still don't understand. None of you understand this world. We know what needs to be done, and we never hesitate. We have survived step by step to this point. You all just sit inside your walls, making plans and hesitating. Tiana, you pretend to know everything, but you don't know shit. You all just wish this world wasn't like this. Do you want to survive? Do you want this place to endure? Your ways have long ended. Things don't get better just because they're imaginary. From now on, we have to live in reality. Before he could finish, Michonne attacked him from behind. She was also one of the community's law enforcement officers and someone who wanted to stay and live a peaceful life. The next day, Rick woke up, feeling a bit dizzy. His wounds had been treated. He carefully surveyed his surroundings, realizing that he was in an unfamiliar place. To his surprise, Michonne was there. She had been watching over him all night. Michonne is puzzled by Rick's behavior, because she wanted to stay and live a peaceful life in the community. Rick said calmly at this point, things were moving too fast. Noah had another incident. That's why it was so extreme. At that moment, Glenn and the others arrived. Where'd you get the gun? Before Rick could answer, Carol spoke first. You took it from the armory, didn't you? That was a foolish act. Why did you do it? Rick understood. Carol didn't want to expose herself. 
To remain a transparent person, he wouldn't reveal her secret. Glenn mentioned that Deanna was planning a meeting tonight, and everyone could attend. It seemed like they would discuss exiling Rick. Carol advised Rick to use the opportunity at the meeting to speak sincerely, adopt a remorseful attitude, and come up with a compelling story. Michonne was puzzled about why they had to go to such lengths. Carol bluntly stated that the people here were like children who enjoyed hearing stories. Rick made up his mind that if things didn't go well at the meeting, they would follow his signal. It was clear that without bloodshed, they wouldn't learn how to survive. Michonne still believed in the possibility of resolving the matter peacefully. It's clear that she and Glenn don't want to do this, they had adapted to this way of life. However, Carol unconditionally supported Rick. In a post-apocalyptic world, democracy simply does not work. Then Rick sent them away. Rick claimed he needed to rest for a while. When they had all gone Carol came back again and said it was fine now. Everyone thought they had taken your gun. As she spoke, she handed another gun to Rick. Rick asked why she didn't let them know she had a gun. Carol didn't shy away from the truth and said that Michonne stopped him and even knocked him unconscious. She was more inclined toward Deanna's side. It was still a long time before the evening meeting. Unbeknownst to Rick, his old friend had arrived nearby. Morgan was about to make his formal appearance. 